Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt Winston from Stan Winston School, and very, very excited to welcome you to our very first Google Plus Connected Classroom virtual field trip. Uh, this is something that excites us because uh, obviously the young people are our future and to be able to connect with you guys live like this and bring you somewhere that you wouldn't have an opportunity to go makes us so happy. We are here today at Spectral Motion, one of Hollywood's premier creature effects and character creation studios and we're sitting here with Spectral Motion's founder, uh, Mike Elizalde. How Hello. are you, Mike? I'm doing great. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Spectral Motion. We're really excited to have you guys here with us. And today we are being joined by a couple classrooms. We have number one, Sam Ritolo Middle School. Am I pronouncing that correctly, kids? Give me a thumbs up if I said it right. Awesome. And you guys are the eighth grade 3D art class, I understand. And you're just getting into sculpture this week. That's very exciting. We're going to show you a little bit about how sculpture is uh, incorporated into this field. We're also being joined by the Academy of Scientific Exploration at Cesar Chavez Learning Academies, and we're being joined by the Honors Chemistry class. And believe it or not, knowing your chemistry is also very important in creature effects, and we'll talk about where chemistry comes in. Um, but first of all, what is creature effects, Mike? What, what is this? Please, break it down for these young people. So creature effects, I mean, it's anything that involves uh, creating something that is, is lurking deep within the recesses of your imagination. Uh, monsters, aliens, science fiction, uh, any deformities, any, anything that, that involves you know, presenting something in front of a camera uh, to be filmed for, for either a, a movie or television series or whatever it is, that's what we do here. We, we run the gamut of the entire creative process from illustration to standing in front of the camera with the director and presenting our effects. So it's a pretty broad scope of, of things that we do. Um, and can you tell the kids, obviously I know your credits very well, but can you tell the kids some of the work they have seen that's come out of Spectrum Motion? Well, some of the most famous stuff that we've done here, in fact, our first project that really put us on the map as an ind independent studio is Hellboy. Uh, and we, we've done the first Hellboy movie, and we did the second Hellboy movie, and then we did some, uh, some Marvel projects. Uh, we did uh, both of the Fantastic Four movies. We did two of the X-Men movies. And um, we've done, I think, my personal, um, my personal portfolio is, is a resume, I should say, is about 75 or 80 movies long. So I've been in the industry a very long time. Um, and I'm sure you'd recognize a lot more movies if I showed you the, the long, long list. But I don't want to bore you guys. We're, we're limited in time. So, so after this hangout, uh, log in to imdb.com and type in Mike Elizalde, and you'll see all that he's done. Um, we're going to move you around through the shop, but before we do, I would like to talk to you about what uh, Mike and I and the rest of the team here hope you take from this. Uh, this is probably the best time in history to be an artist. Um, the, the days of artists painting pictures on the side of the road and struggling to make any money selling their portraits is gone. We have video games, we have films, we have television, we have web series, comic books. All of that requires artists and technicians who can help the artists realize their uh, work in whatever medium they're working in. So we hope what you take from this is that it is possible to have a life filled with creativity. That's sort of our, our goal here. It's true. Everything, everything that you look at in your world around you, everything started with an artist's concept. So it, it, art, artistry is, is involved in every single aspect of life, and it certainly plays a very important role in, in what we do here. All right. Well, without further ado, I think we should both walk into the next room because we'd like to show you some finished pieces uh, before we show you the process. And those are in the next room. So we're going to start walking now. Slowly. Slowly. Follow me, John. Yeah, I'm just going to follow you, Matt. That's exactly the plan. I messed it up. I wasn't supposed to do this. Wait, no, I got messed up because I got trapped behind you. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. We're going to be a little sloppy in this portion. So Walk on through, Matty. So tell us where we're at, uh, Mike. What is this room? So this is our showroom. Uh, this is where we welcome all of our guests when they first arrive here. 
And we like to sort of present some of our finished pieces first so that everybody can get an idea of what it looks like after the whole process is finished. And uh, some of the pieces that I always show people are, um, first of all, I start with, with a motion prop. And this hand over here that you see uh, is part of a larger costume. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters or not, but this is part of the, the large troll whose name is Edward. Let me just run this for you real quick. It takes a second to fire up, but you can see what it does, okay? What we do here is we try to articulate every single point of articulation that you would expect to see in a real person's hand video call in a mechanical representation. Whoa. So there it is doing its thing. You can see that it does, it, it has the display that your hand does. It has full thumb movement. Everything that, that our hands do, we have incorporated into this device. And as I said, this is just one component of a large suit that a, an actor wears. So that's that guy. And then over here on my left, as I come around this way, is another character that we designed for a movie called Your Highness. It's a little mechanical bird named Simon. He does all sorts of stuff. And uh, one of the reasons we love to show this guy is because this is a character that we actually use to make the movie with. We built it here, we took it to the set, and we filmed with him for about two months, and then we brought him back here, put him right there, and he's been running ever since. So what that tells our directors and producers is how durable our work is. You know, a lot of times people are afraid that animatronics aren't going to work. Well, this is uh, living proof that they actually do work, and they work for a very long time. Can you, so, zoom in a little bit? Can you tell us uh, how many servos are in this guy? There's probably about, I would say, uh, 16 points of axis, so probably about 20 servos that, that do a lot of different things. You all the things. The sure I can. Uh, and his eyes light up. He's got all sorts of, uh, you can see his little beak opening and closing, little feathers expand on his wings. Um, and as you can see, there isn't a whole lot connecting him to the base because the reason for that is because all of the servos are inside of his body. There isn't anything external except a power cord that runs down to a, a, a power supply that keeps him running. So he's pretty much self-contained. And he's old. He's got a little chip on his face there. That's because he's been around for a really long time. But he's still very active. <laughs> I, I have a question yeah. for you, uh, Mike. Actually, I'll get on camera. This character obviously has a performance loop that mm -hmm. you've programmed. Yes. Uh, when you created him, uh, was he required to perform in real time uh, with RC controllers? That's, that's a good point, yes. Um, whenever we display pieces like this, we do run it on a con uh, continuous loop, this and the hand that you saw earlier. Uh, but when we're on set, we have a team of puppeteers that are led by me, and I work directly with the director uh, to give the performance. So we do live performance. And the way we do that is we have uh, remote control units, like the ones you see people uh, with little remote control cars or airplanes. Exactly the same device, except we're creating a, a performance for a character. And I think this is a great opportunity also to point out that this is proof that in creature effects and in what you do, art and science come together. It's Absolutely. not just a place for artists, it's a place for technicians, mm -hmm. uh, mechanics. I know at my father's shop they brought in uh, technicians from the aerospace industry exactly. who loved yes. creatures and were able yeah. to apply their scientific experience to creating characters. That's that's a great point. It's it's definitely a, a right brain, left brain kind of industry. We, we, we love people who understand both sides of the equation, technical and artistic because that's really what you need to understand in order to make it all work together. And didn't you uh, start out as a mechanic in, in the industry? I actually started out as a sculptor, oh, a sculptor. and a painter and an, a makeup artist, and then I eventually became an animatronics designer. Okay. And so, yeah, I did both both sides of the of the field there. So well, you're one of the few great. artists I know who actually knows what's going on inside and can, <laughs> can do it. Uh, so for those of you who love uh, fantasy but you don't have any artistic skill, if you happen to have some mechanical skill, there is a place for you in this industry. I'm going to move ahead to our next spot, Mike, but I'm not going to drive Johnny crazy by okay. 
making him rush. So okay. uh, if there's anything else you'd like to show in here, sure. I will meet you in the paint booth. Okay, I'll just... Big character um, is uh, Samael from the first Hellboy movie. And uh, this was a great challenge for us because we had to get an actor to fit inside of this. And then we had to invent some new systems uh, to make it work on set. Our director, Guillermo del Toro, didn't want us to have any cables going to the character, even though he had all these tentacles on his head that, that actually moved. Um, so we had to invent a whole new kind of tentacle and uh, create the algorithm or the software that actually drove all the motors that were inside of these tentacles to make it look like his hair was made out of eels. It was really creepy, a really cool effect. And I, I often get the uh, remark that people thought it was a CG character. Well, I'm happy to tell all of you it's not CG, it's real. It's a very real thing. Um, over on the other side of the room here, I'll walk you guys over here. Um, this is an animatronic puppet that was used for Hellboy, again. Um, he actually came to life. All of his arms that pointed and that rope right there around his neck was... And that was used to summon Hellboy from another dimension. If you look closely in this poster here, the movie poster, you can see the, the mechanical hand in the, in the image right there. And that's what was used in the film. And that is the original prop from the movie. So I think we're ready to join Matt unless you have another question. I have a question. Yeah. What departments would this pass through, starting from design? Like It seems like a lot of different stuff is happening here. It's, um, it's, really, it's one of those situations where every department had a, a role in this. And that's one of the things that we'll sort of discuss as we go around is that there, there are every, every discipline of artistic creativity or, or technical knowledge is used in creating something like this. Uh, because we had an artist named Ty Rubin Ellingson who drew this for Guillermo. They gave us the drawing and then our, our mechanical team and our construction team who did all the leather pieces and all the quilting fabric got together and started making things. And then we had all of these little glass tubes actually custom blown, which means they, they took molten glass and they made those tubes to our specifications so they would fit exactly as we needed them to. And if you look really closely, you can see a little a desiccated frog inside of that tube. It's not a real frog. It was sculpted by one of our sculptors and cast and painted and put inside of a liquid uh, container. Uh, and that's what you're seeing there. The, the whole idea behind this was that it was black magic and science and sort of the, the, uh, the, the time frame in which this was made was the 1940s. So this is sort of made to reflect that kind of... Uh, technical knowledge that they had in those days. Um, and uh, we're very happy with this. This is the only one that was ever built, and it was used in the film, and Guillermo, our director, was kind enough to let us keep it. So we're, this is one of our trophies here at Spectral Motion. We're really proud of it. Awesome. Let's you go ready to Matt move on? Paint. Okay, let's go this way. We're going to catch up with Matt out here in the shop. Hey, hey guys! Uh, I am here in the art department. The is this the paint department? This is our paint department, Matt. Yeah, this is where um, all of our designs come to get color. Mm -hmm. So everything starts out looking sort of, you know, desaturated and uncolored, kind of like this this sculpture over here. And um, eventually, we start to put layers and layers of paint onto the characters. And as you can see, the modeling work that goes into creating a, a finished uh, paint job is very complicated. There's a lot of different layers of paint that get involved into creating something that looks real. So. And before we go much further forward, would you mind taking them through, since we do have some designs here, we do have sculpture, will you take them a little bit through, you get a script, mm -hmm. what's next? Okay, so we're handed a script for a movie. We go through the script and we read all the places in the script where it calls for an effect, a character, a wound, whatever it is, and we break those out. And we create a document called a, a script breakdown. And from that document, we create a budget which tells the directors and the producers how much it's going to cost to make everything, right? <laughs> then, once we get an approval on that, we start drawing what uh, the effects are going to look like. On the wall behind me here, are a lot of different illustrations, drawings that were created by different industry artists 
And um, that's the next step. Once the drawings are approved and everybody's happy with the way it looks on paper, then we create what's called a maquette uh, in sculpture. This is a clay maquette that was done for uh, a film. It's a presentation piece that gives everybody a clue as to what the three-dimensional piece is going to look like in their film. Uh, and what's nice about a piece like this is that it's small and it's contained, and we can make changes very quickly before we commit to the full design. I have to say, you guys are very, very lucky, the, the guys who are in the 3D sculpture class, because sculpting is something that you either learn by trial and error or that you learn by somebody actually teaching you who knows what they're talking about. A lot of us did our learning by trial and error, and, and I, I remember when I was first learning how to do this stuff, looking through books, trying to find a place that would show me how to sculpt. Well, that wasn't really readily available, and I wasn't actually working in a place where I could learn that. So I just took clay and figured it out as, much, as best as I could. Ultimately, I became more involved, and I learned from great people like, like Matt's dad um, how to do the work uh, with my own hands. But really, you guys are, are really in, in a great spot to, to be learning this from, from very experienced people. So once the sculpture is approved in small scale, mm -hmm. you guys will move into the full scale uh, rendition. Exactly. Using yeah. either uh, wed clay, if it's large, or Chavant clay, or even, uh, do you guys print? Do you, uh, We do, yeah. Um, we do. We use every, every piece of technology that's available to us. We, um, uh, Matt's right. Once this is approved, we create the full size piece. And to do that, we have to cast an actor. Um, which means we have to put gooey stuff all over the actor's face, hands, and, and body to get an impression of them so that we can create the sculpture that goes on their body. It's, it's a complicated system, but it really works really, really well. And then we're not going to take them into the mold shop, right. but mm -hmm. after that is approved, the full size, you guys will mold it yes. to preserve it mm -hmm. and then create the skins yeah. or whatever it's going to be, whether it's foam latex exactly. or silicone. Mm -hmm. And then we're into the painting. So and then we're into the painting. That uh, gets that us brings back us to right that. up to speed to where we are right now. Can we show them some of the tools, uh, your painters? Did a quick question. Yes, um, we did. Sure. Some of the, the kids or one of the students are wanting to know what kind of education in terms of computer education or computer programming would be beneficial or would you recommend in terms of long-term process? Um, well, because it's such a multifaceted uh, place, uh, there's so many disciplines that are that are used. I think that. Pretty much any artistic endeavor is, is a viable thing that will apply to what we're doing here. Um, but as far as uh, uh, our designers have to know how to use a computer, they need to know how to use the software to create artistic renderings. Photoshop, uh, Photoshop ZBrush. Exactly, ZBrush, uh, even Maya, Maya. You know, or some, some of the more advanced animation uh, software that's out there is, is useful. Um, so pretty much if you're, if you're in an art school and you're learning some discipline, you probably would be able to do something here at our studio as well. And on the technical side, for those of you who are drawn to that, learning Arduino technology is, uh, I think, very important. Uh, that's sort of the new trend in, in animatronics a little bit. Yeah. Uh, also, learning CAD design mm -hmm. programs, learning how to design and construct mechanical devices in a computer environment is something they should become Absolutely, familiar with? Absolutely, yes, yes. That's something that we do all the time. Back in the old days when I first started, we used to draw stuff on paper, all of our, our mechanical designs. Now we have very powerful software that allows us to create a three-dimensional version of what we're building before we even build it, which is terrific because we can test it before it's built. It's, uh, it's a great technology to have. It used to be just pencil and paper. It used to remember be those days? I do remember. <laughs> you don't know how lucky you kids are. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's a, a a great new world of possibilities for you guys to explore and be even more creative than we ever had the chance to be. And I'm going to move ahead to the next area, uh, so that we can be set up in mechanical. But Mike, I think it would be wonderful for you to show them a little bit of the tools that are used in painting. Absolutely. From airbrushes to, to regular old brushes. Sure, I'm going to sure. leave you to it. All right. So um, I started explaining to Matt that um, painting is, is a very diverse kind of thing because not only do we have to paint flexible materials and make sure that the paint stays put when it's stretching and moving, but we also have to be able to paint rigid materials and make it look you know, like an automotive finish. It's got to be clean and perfect. So it's a really, a really involved process. 
a lot of our artists use uh, airbrushes to create some of the finer details. This is a, a, an Iwata airbrush. It's a really nice tool to have if you're a painter uh, because you can get a lot of this really cool looking modeled finish. Uh, that's all airbrushed in very, very carefully. Um, it's like a little tiny, uh, you know, can of spray paint that you can make very, very small patterns with. Um, we also use dry brush techniques, which means that you take a paintbrush and you can either paint directly onto the surface or you can take the bristles and just sort of spatter the paint in, in position to create different patterns and different uh, color schemes. So painting is a really fascinating part of what we do. It's, it's uh, one thing to see a sculpture that is not painted, kind of like uh, something like this guy back here. This is unpainted, so it looks, it's interesting because it's sculpture, you know, but once you put paint on it and it becomes something a little more creepy and more alive, it's, it, it really kind of brings it to life, you know. The, that's, that's one of the greatest parts of, of putting color onto something is that it actually gels as a living thing, and, and it's a very exciting part of the, of the equation. Another quick question sure. is, is how important is collaboration and teamwork in the overall process of bringing all of this to life? It's incredibly important. Uh, we, we rely heavily on the fact that all of our team members work together. They all understand what, what the next person is doing in, in the next part of the uh, process. And then it all comes together and that's what really makes things work is when everybody understands each other's needs and each other's requirements and, uh, and we all participate together that way. When, uh, when the sculpture is being created, our animatronic guys are already involved telling the sculptors how far apart they need the eyes to be for the mechanics to work, um, how the mouth needs to be positioned so that when it's moving, it moves correctly. So it is a very collaborative uh, uh, pro process from start to finish. Even, even in the 2D stage, when people are just drawing the flat images, we have all of our departments weigh in and say, well, you know, we can do this, but maybe we need to modify this a little bit before we can actually commit to being able to deliver that. So, yeah, collaboration and teamwork is incredibly important. Let's go look at some robots. <laughs> Somebody said, let's go look at the robots. I guess we're going to move on to the mechanical shop. Is that where we're going next? Yes. Okay. Guys, on to ready? the... Uh... You guys ready? They're moving. Okay, here we awesome. go. Hey, we are now in Spectrum Motion's mechanical department. All the art is one thing, but to make it move, you need mechanics. And you're seeing, I'm sure Mike will explain a little better what this particular mechanical device is, but uh, if we can slowly pan around the room, you're going to see lots of doodads and doohickeys that are all very important to this. We have... Uh, lathes and mills. Uh, if you continue going around to the right, Jake, you're going to see machines for shaping metal. Uh, you're going to see band saws and drill presses, lathes, mills. These are all skills that mechanics need to have. Although now with 3D printing, I'm seeing more and more mechanics getting into printing out mechanical parts. Obviously, it doesn't work as well for large-scale creatures where you need the strength, but for a set of mechanical eyes, you can 3D print them. Well, it's, it's actually gotten better and better as the technology has advanced. But um, printing parts, you can actually print parts out of carbon fiber. So, that's true. So you can actually get a very, very strong part that's printed in, in, a, in a device. Uh, but, you know, we do use all of the technologies that are yes. available. We do a lot of machining. Uh, we do a lot of water jet cutting, which is a really great tool. Water jet, they take a, a high-pressure water stream to cut a very precise pattern in metal. It's, it's amazing. It's fascinating what, uh, what can be done these days. Um, this is Mark Satrakian. This is one of our lead designers here hey, at Mark. Spectral Motion. How are you? Matt How are you? Um, Mark is the... Uh, I'm going to step away and engineer. let you guys let's, take let's, over. Let's uh, introduce Mark for a second. I, I want to introduce Mark because not only is he one of our, our premier designers, the premier designer here at Spectral, but he's a very dear friend of mine, and we worked together for a very long time. So this is Mark. Say hello to the kids. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, um, Mark, I'll let you continue doing what you're doing. I don't want right. to interrupt your, your process, uh, so I'm going to get back with Matt. Okay, come on back. Matt. All right, Mark. <laughs> I thought we'd have you longer, but go work. Well, uh, I'll, I'll come back <laughs> to you. Okay. Here. So just come up with some questions and I'll answer them. Terrific. Okay. Sounds good. I think Sounds one good. thing that we could talk to the kids about, obviously, 
it's one thing to create a character or creature that looks terrific, mm -hmm. but if he doesn't move, he's just a statue. Right. He or she. He or she. Uh, or what <laughs> are some of the methodologies you guys use to move characters? Um, well, there's a lot of different techniques that can be employed. Uh, we generally use uh, elect elect electronics, servo motors, uh, uh, any kind of thing that you have to plug into a battery or a uh, power uh, uh, supply. Uh, we also use hydraulics, and we also use um, pneumatics, which is air. Hydraulics is fluids, and pneumatics is air. Uh, but there, there's no end to the systems that can be used to create movement. Um, uh, I, I'd love for you to ask Mark some questions in a, in a few minutes. Oh, absolutely. He, he can really speak to this, uh, absolutely. To this issue. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, you're looking at some, some servo-operated uh, system up there that Mark designed. That's one of his art pieces for, for a, a gallery that he created. Um, and that's the nice thing uh, that this illustrates is his, his idea of creating a, a, a tentacle made out of servos. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, an invention that he came up with. And that's the, the, uh, the way that the hair worked on Samael, which I showed you guys next door with all the hair uh, tentacles. Uh, that's the, the, a very similar system to what was used on that character. Well, having puppeteered many tentacles in my day, <laughs> I, I know that with multi-stage tentacles to coordinate everyone's movements to get uh, nice fluid motion is difficult at times. It and is. This is brilliant. It's tricky. And not only that, but you've got a big bundle of cables that have to come out of the character mm -hmm. to a set of controllers that you can operate. With this system, that whole thing is eliminated, and it's uh, it's, it's all self-contained, yeah, and you can terrific. move your character anywhere you want. Exactly, exactly. Uh, do we have? We did have a question about uh, training. Do you? Does it require a two to four year degree to get into a field like this? What do you tell uh, prospective monster makers about the importance of an actual university or two year degree? I think that's that's really sort of a, a, an individual thing. Um, in my case, I, I graduated high school, and then I was in the Navy for eight years, and then I jumped right into this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, other people have, you know, engineering degrees. Other people have some college education. Uh, it's really varied. It, there, there's no, like, hard and fast rule as to what your education needs to be to get into a place like this. Well, I think the Navy was probably the best training you ever could have gotten for this industry. It, it taught me discipline and mm -hmm. punctuality, but you know, as far as technical training, I did get some background, but the real technical training came from me working with guys like Mark, who, who really taught me a lot of things. And uh, my, my experience was learning on the job, and uh, it, was, it was a great way to learn. And unfortunately, that is the case for most people who are interested in this industry, because they're other than stanwinstonschool.com and a few others, there are very few universities you can go to that will teach you the specific skill sets you need for this. Exactly. A lot of the time, you're applying skill sets that were not created for this industry and applying them to this industry. That's correct, yeah. 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 I think it's a, a, a thing, one of the things I wanted to mention to all of you guys is about being patient with your own skills and your own ability at any given point in time because that will develop as, as you learn more about what you're doing. And if you're frustrated by something you're trying to do, don't let that stop you. Keep doing it. And every time you try it again, slow yourself down a little bit. Give yourself the time to, to let it breathe and let it, let it develop uh, within yourself. And uh, eventually, you'll be doing stuff that amazes you. So, so keep it up. And that's such a great point. And don't be afraid to fail. Exactly. Failures, you learn so much more from your failures than from your successes. And I, I know I have a bit of a perfectionist streak, and I'm sure some of you out there do. And if your first sculpture isn't perfect, you're going to ah, why bother? It's really, you have to get past that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do we want to take some questions? From yes, we have some questions. So shoot them out. Here. Absolutely. By the way, if you're having fun, give us a thumbs up. If you'd like okay. to be here in person, give us a <laughs> thumbs up. Wouldn't that be awesome? So uh, hopefully this virtual hangout is the first step towards some of you making a trip to Los Angeles and exploring this world because we need a new generation of monster makers. Absolutely, yeah.
Yeah. So do you want to ask them to unmute their microphone if they want to ask them? Yes, yeah, so if you unmute your microphone on your computer in your classroom, we'll actually be able to hear you and you can ask us questions. Do you guys have any questions? Awesome. Yeah, can we see more Yeah, there are. We, you, you, don't, you guys don't mind if Mark stays involved. No, Mark, please. Great, please, great. get right in here. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to take a few questions and then we're going to show you some robots. We have seven minutes left. So who has a question? Shout it out. Question. Anybody have a question? Oh, um, come up here and ask. All right. So we have a question here. Um, do you specialize in one certain thing, or do you use? Um, should you be more knowledgeable in different areas? Great question. I'm sure we might have different answers, but Mike, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think uh, in my case, uh, I specialized in one thing later in my career. Uh, I really wanted to learn all of the aspects of the, of the process, of the artistic process. So I learned how to sculpt, and I learned how to paint, and I learned how to glue stuff on people's faces. And then eventually, when I started working with Mark, I learned how to create animatronic uh, designs and build puppets and puppeteer them. So um, I think the answer is it's good if you specialize in something, but it's also great to have a broader knowledge if you end up having to lead a team someday. Uh, that way you understand more of the processes, you know, what you're doing. And also, within those processes, like Mark, he has to know what the sculptors are doing. He has to know what the mold makers are doing. And ultimately, we all weigh in on what the final character does. So it's good to understand all the processes, but you can't specialize in one thing. Mark, what do you think? I, I agree. I and mean, when I first started out, I was actually, uh, I was 19. I was trying to get a job at ILM. And uh, at the time, I didn't really, I didn't really know that there was uh, specialization. I didn't know that people did one thing or another. So I was like, I was drawing and sculpting and painting and making all kinds of different things, and also doing mechanics. And when I got an opportunity to show my work to somebody that I was going to get a job from, the thing that they said was really good was the mechanical thing. So that's when I began to specialize. But what I've found over the years is that you, you've got to have an understanding and an interest in all of those things, and it just makes you better. Um, the, the most successful things that I've worked on, um, well, like, for example, have you guys seen Edward the, Edward the Troll from, from Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters? So that, that character, that face, uh, Chet, Sar, and I sat together and worked on the sculpture, and he was sculpting, and I was just talking to him. I was like, okay, well, here's what I think I can do mechanically, and we'd have this dialogue, and together we got the sculpture to the point where it was, it was the perfect complement to the mechanism that I had in mind. Um, I really think of these things that we make as this holistic thing. It's, it's, not, it's not different people working in isolation, then the pieces somehow go together. You've really got to work together, and it's, it's very much a team environment. And actually, that's one of the things that I love about this business is these, these incredibly talented people that I'm privileged to work with. It's, it's a joy every day. I'm working with... You know, oh, you've got a sculptor over yeah. here, an ex-aerospace engineer over here, and uh, it, you're, you're so right. Yeah. It's, uh, I've personally never seen an industry where so many different skills come together. Maybe it exists, but I don't know what industry that is. It's pretty unique that way. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why don't we see some of your robots, uh, Mark? Um, sure. I, I uh, and and Mike, because everyone loves robots. <laughs> can we uh, can we head on over there? Okay, kids, can you mute yourselves now uh, on your laptop in your classroom? Because we're getting a little bit of feedback. And we have three minutes to go. Three minutes. So we're going to wrap it up with some robots. We're going to let Mark talk about it because this is his baby. Boom! Boom! Baby! Boom! All right! <laughs> boom! That boy. So uh, I know we only have a few minutes. We gotta do this every month. Different show. Switch to Jake, please. Cool. All right. Let me know when you guys are ready. Set. Right here. Oh hi. I'll stand over here next. To All you. right. So earlier this year, uh, I, I had a TV show called Robot Combat League, and the robots were all built here at Spectral Motion. Um, Robot Combat League is a show with, uh, you know, huge eight-foot-tall robots that beat the crap out of each other. And they're controlled by, by human athletes. So what we've got here are, uh, this is my prototype. This was the thing that I built to kind of sell the idea to the Sci-Fi Network. 
And then to, to my left, I've got kind of some of the wreckage of some of the robots. Um, and you can see this thing is all kind of taken apart. Uh, here's its head. <clears throat> so this is actually the head of a robot that was bashed in you know, during one of its fights. Um, this thing is made entirely of steel. Uh, it's all welded and pretty tough. The robots are hydraulic, and it is almost impossible to convey how powerful and fast and dangerous these things are. Uh, it was a really, really fun project. Uh, incredible amount of work, though. We built um, 12 robots in, what was it, two months? Something Very short time. Yeah, something yeah. like that. It was, well, maybe it was four months. I also anyway. should mention, uh, while Mark's explaining this, that this, this is Mark's brainchild. I mean, this was something that he, he visualized and conceptualized and, and built uh, with a, a little help with a producer friend. But uh, this, this was really something that Mark came up with. And it speaks not only to the fact that he's technically gifted, but also as a concept artist, it's, it's, it speaks for itself. The work is, is right well, there. I had a lot of help, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you, Mike. Well, this um, is where understanding all the various uh, techniques and approaches came in handy, right? Because uh, you weren't just able to execute true. the mechanics, and but the other thing the that I would that I would mention is that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, class is always in session. I am never. Uh, I don't feel like I got myself to a certain point technically, or got myself to a certain point educationally. It's like, great, now I have the tools to do my work. I'm never satisfied with that, and I'm always I'm learning how to write software. It's hard, but I'm learning how to do other things. Uh, it's the only way you can you can elevate your work, and uh, it's really rewarding. It takes a lot of work. I do a lot of work on my on my own on the side, and that's how stuff like this comes. Into so, so you hear that, kids? Just when you thought school was over, you were wrong. <laughs> you will always be in but, school. But think about you know, like a concert <laughs> pianist. Do you think that they just they only play on stage? No, they they practice all the time, and we have to do the same thing. So, uh, we we have two. I think one minute left. We have, um, we have time yeah. for perhaps. One or two more questions before we say goodbye. I don't know about you guys, but this has been far too quick uh, for me. I would love to spend all day with Mike and Mark here at Spectrum Motion, but we are coming to an end of this virtual field trip. Do we have any final questions? Robots fight and run around the room. <laughs> we have a lunch truck going by with a very loud horn. I see a question back there. Go ahead. You have to unmute them. Unmute your laptop and ask okay. away. Ask the question. Hello, oh, coming up. Okay. Yeah, so we can see you. Um, okay. Have you guys ever done anything with the Iron Man movies? <laughs> well, that's a that's a good question. Uh, the Iron Man film, uh, the first Iron Man, was created by my father's uh, Creature Effects Studio, and the subsequent films have been handled by his team at Legacy Effects. So. Uh, yes, we've had plenty of involvement in Iron Man. And with that final question, I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, all of you watching, uh, the students uh, at uh, Rotolo, is Sam Rotolo, am I saying it right? Sam Rotolo Middle School, and i got to get my cheat sheet, and, and the Academy of Sciences. Thank you so much. This is the first of many virtual field trips that we will be hosting. We're hoping to do this on a monthly basis and bring you guys into these magic shops uh, all the time. So please join us for our next one. I'd like to thank Mark and Mike Ellis for opening the doors. Thank you for coming. We, we loved having you guys here, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. And if we, I'm going to put you both on the spot. Give us one sentence for each, for all these kids, of advice uh, to leave this virtual field trip on a on a high note. What would you say to the kids out there? And which is our main camera, John? This one. So I would say, don't give up. Mark said the word. I'm learning to do this, but it's hard. It's hard, but he doesn't stop doing it. He keeps going until something like this comes to life. So be diligent and and learn as much as you can. Uh, when I was starting out, uh, I, would, I would take a little bit of Matt's advice. He was saying, don't be afraid of your mistakes. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Um, mistakes are the, the number one thing you will learn from. People can tell you how to do something, but when you, when you do it yourself, it doesn't work out, and then you find out why it doesn't work out, that is so powerful. Um, and when you're beginning, uh, like, like 
I was when I was a kid, keep the stakes low. Make something small. And if you make a mistake, it's fairly insignificant. You can just keep working on it until it's perfect. And my final comment to you all, and it's a little off the specifics of this industry, is you have one chance on this planet. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't pursue what you love. Pursue what you love, whether it's art or science, and don't settle for anything less because that's what you're going to be great at. Follow your passion, and success will come. And from the Stan Winston School of Character Arts and Spectrum Motion, uh, thank you for joining us for our first ever Google Connected Classrooms virtual field trip. And we will see you all very soon. Thank Bye, guys. You. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay.